In August 1986, 13-year-old Jennifer Bastian stepped out of her house in Tacoma, Washington. She got on her bicycle and rode off, leaving behind a note for her parents, wanting to inform them that she would get home in time for supper. Jennifer was last seen 30 minutes before she was supposed to return home at 6 p.m. After that, Jennifer went missing. An investigation was started and right away, her case was suspected to be linked to that of another girl. She had disappeared under identical circumstances. Were these two tragic cases actually connected, as initial similarities suggested, or was it merely a coincidence? This would be answered years later, when a startling revelation would surface, changing the course of the investigation altogether. At 2.30 p.m. on August 4, 1986, Jennifer got on her bike and headed out with the intention of dedicating time for her training. She had plans to go on an upcoming bicycle tour of the San Juan Islands. Jennifer had a five-mile loop plan through Point Defiance Park, somewhere she had been cycling a lot recently. That afternoon, Jennifer was seen in the park by a number of witnesses. Everything seemed to be normal. At 6 p.m., her last confirmed sighting was reported, and then something transpired, something that ensured Jennifer would not be able to fulfill her commitment to return home by 6.30 p.m. When she still hadn't returned home by 8.30 p.m., Jennifer's parents filed a missing persons report. After a comprehensive search of Point Defiance Park and the surrounding region, they were unable to locate Jennifer. The search went on nonetheless. In an attempt to put together the events of that day, volunteers participated. Tragically, the search for her came to conclusion three weeks after her last known sighting. On August 28th, a person was strolling through a five-mile drive, the same route Jennifer had been seen on. Along the path, he felt an unpleasant smell. Upon a closer look, a body was discovered. The police arrived at the crime scene, and it was verified that the deceased was Jennifer Bastian, her bike was discovered close by as well. After an autopsy was conducted, the coroner concluded that she passed away from asphyxiation. This wasn't a missing persons case anymore. There was a killer at large. Four and a half months prior to Jennifer's disappearance, another girl of the same age had vanished. The investigators working on Jennifer's case started to wonder if these cases were related after they discovered her body. When they noticed the striking parallels, it did make sense why. Michelle Welch, then 12 years old, was last sighted in Puget Park in Tacoma, Washington, on March 26, 1986. Similar to Jennifer, Michelle was outside that day riding a bicycle. She was with her two younger sisters, one was on a bicycle and the other on a skateboard. The Michelle sisters ran off to play as soon as they arrived at the park. An hour later, at 11 a.m., she made the decision to ride her way home and prepare lunch for everyone. When Michelle returned to the park, she set the lunch she brought on a table. After that, she set out to locate her sisters who had gone to a nearby store to use the bathroom. When the girls got back, they came across the lunch Michelle had brought them. However, their older sister was gone. They kept on playing for a bit longer until about 2 p.m. Subsequently, one of the girls noticed that Michelle's bike stood there besides her own. This caused a wave of alarm. Where exactly was Michelle if she was still in the park? The girls returned home to notify their parents after they couldn't locate her. Police arrived at the park about 3.10 p.m. to look for Michelle. Hours afterwards, her body was discovered. It was less than half a mile from where her sisters had been playing for much of the day. Based on the injuries on her body, it was evident that whoever killed her was a crazy and violent person. Swab samples were collected, though in 1986, the genetic forensics for cases of crime was still in early days. At the time, it was just a minor help towards identifying the guilty. The detectives assigned to Michelle and Jennifer's cases believed they were searching for the same person. The similarities were too apparent to be a coincidence. Thousands of tips poured in, all carefully considered. All of them, regrettably, led nowhere. Year after year passed, and the cases remained unsolved. In 2006, the samples retrieved from Michelle's body were re-examined. A profile was created. 
Nevertheless, no findings surfaced from any of the databases, and with that, any hopes of finally putting an end to this investigation that has been ongoing for two decades was dashed. The next phase took place in 2013, when Jennifer's case was studied by an investigator. He insisted on doing a test for DNA on the swimmers she was wearing that day. Since all those years ago, it had never been tested as it was discovered around her ankle. Because of this, it was assumed that the offender would not have left behind any substantial DNA. However, upon examination, it was discovered that the swimmers had bodily fluids from the offender, then, it was time to test the samples for a match. Everyone who was associated with the investigation was taken aback by what that test uncovered. They were not looking for a single criminal, but two of them. The profiles of the DNA taken from Michelle and Jennifer were not a match. They now understood that the investigations had to be conducted separately. When the sample recovered from Jennifer's swimmers was compared to the national database, nothing came up. The detectives handling Jennifer's case went through old files and listed a number of possible suspects. They intended to collect samples of DNA from them. Among them was a man named Robert Washburn. Robert was 60 years old and residing in Illinois in 2017. Robert voluntarily provided a sample upon request, which seemed unlikely to be the behavior of someone who was to be guilty. However, upon getting the results they found out that Robert Washburn was in fact the person they had been looking for. He was responsible for what transpired with Jennifer Bastian. Washburn was placed under arrest and later extradited to Washington for facing charges. Back in 1986, Washburn's age was 29. He resided just nine blocks from Jennifer's family's house and was employed as a mechanic for Boeing as. Washburn eventually got married and relocated, he spent the following three decades living as a free man, had a daughter, and never raised any red flags regarding his disturbing history. For those acquainted with Washburn, he was just a man who spent most of his life taking care of his disabled daughter. Early in the investigation, the initial investigator came across Washburn's name, but there wasn't sufficient evidence to link him to the crime. At the time, he was just one of several suspects under consideration. In light of the impending trial, Washburn changed his initial not-guilty plea to a guilty plea to the charges brought against him. Washburn received a sentence of 26 and a half years in jail, with the requirement that he serve at least 20 years before being eligible for parole. During the sentencing, he remained silent, but a written statement was read in his place. A part of it stated, I recognize there is little that my words can do to diminish the tremendous sense of pain and loss that this has caused many people. Jennifer's mother, Patty Bastian, spoke in court about the family's constant terror and dread during the pleasant days of summer. She remarked, We continue to live and laugh and love, but in a much different way. She also talked about how the city was impacted by the incident. Children ceased to play outside unsupervised and commuting to school turned into a practical challenge, she claimed. Teresa Bastian, Jennifer's sister, admitted in court that she had not taught her daughter how to ride a bicycle. She said to Washburn, You made me an only child. Ultimately, Michelle Welsh received some measure of justice, too, owing to DNA. The offender's family tree was generated via DNA phenotyping, this suggested a connection with two brothers who were both potential persons of interest. At the time of Michelle's disappearance, the two were Tacoma residents. Given that information, the police went out to collect each person's DNA sample. The one that showed to be a match was Gary Hartman. In 2022, he was indicted with the crime and placed on trial. Hartman burst into tears after being declared guilty, repeatedly saying, I am so sorry. At the time, a 26-year prison term was imposed on the 70-year-old. That means that one thing is for sure. He is going to remain imprisoned for the rest of his life. Michelle's mother, Barbara Leonard, as well as the younger sisters, Nicole Eby and Angela Velasquez, addressed the court about how their lives were affected by her passing. Michelle was a happy child. She was also trusting, too trusting, Barbara claimed. 
She went on to say that she has often wished that she could switch places with Michella. This is the day Hartman faces the judge. I say lock him up and throw away the key. It will not bring her back, but justice will have been served. Nicole spoke extensively about feeling like she had to mature too soon and about having constant nightmares following her sister's death. She still has trouble putting up walls with other people, even her family, out of fear of losing more of the people she cherishes. She also stated that she forgives Hartman. Imagine a quiet neighborhood at night, streetlights casting long shadows. In a dimly lit lot, an abandoned car sits with its doors open and windows shattered on the ground. Next to it lies a man's lifeless body. His wife standing nearby, terrified and confused. How did this happen? Who is responsible? Keystone Islands is a neighborhood within the city of North Miami, Florida, United States. It is located in the south of Eastern Shores and just north of San Susi Estates. In 1961, Joseph Demare, a 53-year-old man, was slain in this neighborhood. Not much is known about his early years, other than the fact that he was born in 1908 and grew up in Boston. He, along with his younger brothers, started a business selling produce from push carts. Their small business quickly grew into an established enterprise as they ventured into the farming, importation, and distribution of both domestic and foreign produce. Joseph's drive and perseverance over time carried him toward prosperity and achievement. He was a gentleman, but he never stopped working. One of Joseph's sons, Richard Demare, described his father as someone who wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty. In 1956, Joseph's wife passed away from cancer, leaving him a widower with four kids, three boys in college and a young girl. In 1959, he married a second time to a woman named Frances. Frances was 20 years younger to Joseph, but being with her healed his heart. The couple made their home on the peaceful surroundings of North Miami's Keystone Island, settling in with Joseph's young daughter. Joseph's son, however, lived on campus, but they stayed in close contact with their father and visited him on a regular basis. Life seemed to be fulfilling until something unexpected happened and disturbed their peace. On the evening of March 24, 1961, Joseph's wife, Frances, barged into a gasoline station in San Susi Estates. Her voice trembled as she phoned the police to inform them of the tragic news. It was about her husband. He was slain. Her account of the incident presented a terrifying picture of what happened that fateful night. Frances told the police that at approximately 7.15 p.m., she and her husband, Joseph, had left their house to go to Mike Gordon's restaurant. With Joseph seated in the passenger seat, she was driving their Cadillac Fleetwood. As they came upon an intersection close to Keystone Point, waiting for the signal, two men abruptly entered their car. One of them pulled a handgun toward the back of Frances's head, forcing her to drive to an empty lot in San Susi Estates. In the midst of the chaos, that broke out, Joseph was struck in the face by the butt of the gun. Frances, too, was struck by the assailants as they stripped off her jewelry. At one time, she ignored their instruction of not to take a turn, was hit again by one of the attackers from the back seat, and fainted for a brief moment. A few minutes later, she woke up to find the attackers gone and Joseph lying against the car's door, unconscious, with his head covered in blood. Fear and anxiety overtaking her, Frances forced her way through bushes, shrubs, and sharp rocks until she arrived at the gas station, where she desperately sought safety and assistance. As the police showed up at the specified location in response to Frances' emergency call, the truth about what happened there became clear to them. A car was abandoned there, and just as Frances had mentioned, they found Richard's body inside, succumbing to the injuries. He had sustained severe gunshots to the head that had ended his life. In the rear of the car, they also found two bullet casings. A full-scale investigation was launched. Without delay, the investigators dived right into the intricate web of patterns in an attempt to find answers behind Joseph's death. 
The involvement of a mafia head was also among the possibilities that were considered. But even with a list of suspects that included Francis as well, they were unable to produce any solid leads. Richard's funeral was a mournful ceremony attended by a number of grieving people, saddened by the loss of a man who passed away too young. As the goodbyes were uttered and the soil embraced the deceased, the investigation into his demise seemed to grow quiet. Until it faded into the world unsolved mysteries and became just another cold case. The Demare family felt a cloud of unanswered questions looming over them. Their hearts had become empty and burdened by the lack of justice and closure surrounding Richard's death, and this ache would always be with them. Hope persisted, though, as the days went on. As even the most enigmatic cases in the world of unsolved mysteries can be rekindled by a single spark, a fresh lead, or an eventual breakthrough. However, Richard's murder case would go unanswered for a number of decades before getting a spur of fresh interest in 2019. The Miami-Dade Police Department could not let the truth stay hidden and therefore reopened the case. By May 2023, all of their hard work paid off, revealing a startling discovery. The person found to have committed the horrible crime was none other than Richard's own wife, Frances. How then did the truth surface? For one thing, inconsistencies in Francis's testimony were among the first things the investigators noticed when they revisited the case. The layers of deceit she had expertly built were uncovered when the authorities scrutinized her statements. When the incident took place back in 1961, Francis stated that she ran through the gravelly bushes barefoot, ending up at the gas station to get help. But in spite of her alleged ordeal on the gravel road, Investigators found that Francis's feet were completely uninjured and no cuts or scrape marks on them. Moreover, her shoes were discovered neatly positioned next to the car, adding to the suspicions. Francis's purported route was asked to be replicated by a female deputy in order to verify her account. The deputy ran barefoot over the same course, but her feet got cuts and bruises, while in sharp contrast to Francis's uninjured soles. There was also another discrepancy regarding Francis's statement that she had been pistol-whipped. Following the incident, neither the Richards's family nor the doctors discovered any signs of any facial injuries. Joseph's son, Richard, remarked, On the day of the funeral, her hair was being done at our home, and I stood over her, and I looked in her face, and there were no injuries whatsoever. Now there's more to it than that. During the incident, the two casings retrieved from the rear of the Cadillac were tied to a gun that Joseph had purchased for Francis months ago. Ironically, Richard was the one who delivered the evidence. He disclosed that, months prior to his father's passing, he had fired the same gun into the pool and had kept one of the casings. Following a meticulous examination, the firearms unit established that the casings collected from the Cadillac matched the one Richard had shot into the pool. However, there was still more to uncover in this complex plot. Additionally, the investigators ascertained that the marriage between Joseph and Francis was tense. Prior to his untimely demise, Joseph had made a major change in his will. For his wife, who mostly stayed in Ohio, to be eligible to inherit his wealth, he specified that she must be residing at their residence at the moment of his passing. Mindful of the marriage's decline, Joseph visited Boston the week before his murder for a conversation with his family about his plans. Together, they decided that getting a divorce was the best course of action, and Joseph went back to Miami intending to start the paperwork. These revelations provided insight into the underlying issues that had plagued their relationship. Investigators came to the conclusion that Joseph's intention to break off all ties with Francis was enough of a motivation for her to commit such a heinous act. Furthermore, Richard stated that Francis had benefited from a substantial inheritance of $250,000 after Joseph's passing. Backed with a mountain of credible evidence, the investigators put together a shocking theory. They speculated that the slaying happened in the garage of the couple's own house, right before Joseph and Francis were supposed to leave for dinner. The murder weapon, a handgun carried by Francis, was believed to have been dumped along the path 
possibly under the bridges she crossed throughout her drive. They contend that Francis then took the vehicle to a remote spot on Northeast 122nd Street in San Susi. There, she got out of the car, leaving her purse and gloves behind. She'd taken off her shoes and gently set them next to the car. She approached the nearby gas station cautiously at first, only sprinting at the very last minute. Though the pieces of the puzzle have finally come together to expose Francis as the person behind Joseph's untimely demise, she will never have to deal with the consequences of her actions. This was due to the fact that she had died in 2006, at the age of 82, eluding the jurisdiction of law altogether. For those who have devoted their lives to discovering the truth, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Georgia's Liberty County is among the state's oldest counties. Situated in Liberty County, the quiet woodlands of the Portal Hunting Club, a group of hunters were confronted by an unsettling revelation. There, on Friday, December 2, 2022, partial remains of a white woman were found hidden among the trees. It was evident that the woman had been dead for a while. Moreover, the hunters found a number of clothing stuff next to the victim's body. Included in this were a dark blue long sleeve shirt with the label Morona on it, a camisole top, light gray-blue shorts, and white Amazon Essentials underwear. The hunters stood there in silence, with the burden of this dreadful discovery pressing heavily on their hearts. They realized they had unknowingly become witnesses to a tragedy that had most likely taken place in these woods. The authorities quickly showed up at the crime scene, their arrival marking the beginning of a horrific investigation. As they meticulously scoured through the area, even more horrifying things came to light. Remains of the woman's mutilated body lay strewn over the large area of the hunting club property. The detectives were left bewildered, seeking answers about the events that led to this fateful end. Nevertheless, each clue seemed to evade them, for nothing of her lifeless body provided any clue as to who she might be. The remains were then meticulously retrieved and sent for forensic examination, which offered an opportunity to unveil the truth about this tragic case. As the forensic investigation went on, it was established that the woman had died one to two weeks prior to the discovery. However, the most crucial assignment before them was to reveal her identity. They realized that by knowing who she was, they would be able to piece together how her life had ended in such a horrible way. In an attempt to crack the mystery surrounding the woman's fate, in December 2022, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation took action. They carefully and precisely utilized the expertise of a gifted forensic artist. The artist produced a rendering that conveys a realistic interpretation of how the unnamed woman might have looked like. On December 13th, the authorities released the artist's rendering to the public, in the hopes that someone may identify her. Along with the sketch that was provided, she was believed to be between 5 foot 9 and 5 foot 10 tall, and weighed about 190 to 200 pounds. Surprisingly, she didn't have any tattoos or noticeable scars that would have helped identify her. Police urged anyone who might have known the woman to come forward. They felt that the public's assistance was important in providing her a name, a history, and justice at some point. But as the days stretched into weeks, the investigators began to feel the weight of their failure. Nobody came forward with any information, and the woman remained unknown. Early in 2023, as the investigation into the nameless woman approached a crucial point, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation turned to the FBI. Together, they set out on an elaborate course of action to advance the investigation and ascertain the truth. This paved the way for a phenomenal partnership between experts in genetic genealogy and forensic science. From the woman's remains, they gathered DNA samples and developed a profile. Equipped with a genetic blueprint, they proceeded to look into her lineage. They actively established family trees by searching public and official records, 
tracking each branch in search of possible relatives. Gradually, investigators identified and made contact with potential family members, believing that their memories, recollections, and interactions could possibly reveal the woman's true identity. DNA samples were carefully taken from these people and were then compared to the DNA profile established from the remains. Then, on May 11, 2023, something new came to light. The mysterious woman, whose identity had been obscured with ambiguity, was at last given the name Mindy Casotis. The investigators were overwhelmed that their combined efforts had finally produced fruitful outcomes. With this discovery, the investigation team was one step closer to wrapping up the case and learning more about her fate. When detectives dug into the woman's past, an intriguing tale surfaced. She was found to be a 40-year-old New Orleanian native at the time of her passing. Mindy was an ambitious and accomplished woman. She was passionate about writing and ran a profitable business of her own. Following her graduation from Armstrong State University with a Bachelor of Arts degree, Mindy attended Virginia Tech to complete a master's degree in public and international affairs. In October 2016, she got married to a guy named Nicholas Casotis at Morven Park in Leesburg, Virginia. Nicholas, Mindy's husband, followed a different career path. He was a Reserve Judge Advocate General Corps officer. He began his career in 2006 and, by September 1, 2015, achieved the rank of Lieutenant Commander. But in August 2019, his service in the Navy came to its conclusion. The couple moved to Alexandria, Virginia, after celebrating their honeymoon in Sonoma, California. While at the time of Mindy's tragic passing, they had moved to Savannah, Georgia. Meanwhile, it only takes about 45 minutes to get from their place in Savannah to the wooded area where Mindy's remains were discovered. The fact that the crime scene was so close to their house added to the mystery regarding Mindy's whereabouts and led to a lot of open-ended inquiries for the detectives to work through. In the meantime, news of Mindy Casotis's tragic passing sent shockwaves through the online community, with friends and loved ones expressing sorrow and disbelief. Those who had known her since their school years and spent time with her expressed their sadness and happy recollections on social media. Regarding Mindy's tragic death, authorities were suspicious of her husband, Nicholas, for reasons that had not yet been made public. Thus, on May 12, 2023, Nicholas was arrested and brought into custody in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He was subsequently charged with multiple crimes by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, such as aggravated assault, felony murder, malice murder, and removal of body parts from the scene of the crime. On Friday, May 19, 2023, Nicholas appeared in court for an extradition hearing. The judge wasted no time in ordering his return to Georgia, the state where the atrocious incident occurred, so Nicholas was presumably extradited to Georgia. A week afterward, on Saturday, May 27, 2023, Nicholas found himself back in front of the judge in the Georgia Liberty County Jail. With the formal charges read aloud, there was no room for doubt. Yet any hope of his release was dashed when the judge refused to grant him bail. As the legal proceedings advanced, Nicholas was referred to the Superior Court, which would ultimately determine the outcome of his case. Even now the unanswered question lingers in the air. What could have possibly motivated a man to kill his own wife? The explanation behind it is still unknown. What will happen next is unclear, and whether Nicholas is actually to blame for his wife's untimely passing will ultimately rely on how the court proceedings turn out. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.